Shopify grows your business no matter how far or big you grow. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Whether you're selling your fans' next favorite shirt or an exclusive piece of podcast merch, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Allbirds, Rothy's, Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash income, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash income now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. This content may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion advised. He turned and looked at me. And those sunken eyes still haunt me to this day. I had never seen anything like that before. I found a note on my windshield from him that just said, I'm watching. The nightmare ended there, but I remember how much I just screamed and screamed when I woke up. From Killer Podcasts, true tales of horror, bizarre happenings, unexplainable events, this is Disturbed. Welcome back to the show. This week, we're bringing you four stories that will make you shudder. So sit back, listen closely, and dive into the horror. First, a story narrated by Paul Brown from Reddit user Banshee McGee. A metal detecting experience. Years ago, I was an avid metal detectorist. I knew of an old military trail and river crossing way back in a secluded portion of woods that not many others were aware of, and I was really eager to explore it. One winter morning, I had the day off, and the weather was actually decent. So I decided it was the perfect time to finally check out this area with my metal detector. The trail is about a mile or two from a city park along the South Conco River in San Angelo, Texas. I parked my truck, got all my gear, and began my trek through the raw woods and brush. And about halfway into the trees, I came into a clearing and found an isolated tent and campsite about 40 yards away from the river. Cans were lying all around it, and I also saw some clothes and some other stuff. I mean, it was clear someone was, you know, currently staying there. I continued on my way, but as I was exiting the clearing, a haggard-looking guy came out of the brush just out of nowhere, a a few feet from me. I startled him, I think, just as much as he startled me. After some chit-chat back and forth, he asked me what I was doing in the woods. I told him about the old trail and my metal detecting equipment, and I actually lied that it was a pretty well-known site for hobbyists like me. That last comment seemed to make him a bit anxious. He started asking me if I messed with his campsite at all. And I told him no, you know, other than accidentally stepping on one of the discarded cans. His main concern was if I had looked into his tent, which of course I hadn't. The guy related that his wife had actually kicked him out of their apartment a few days ago, and he was just staying in the woods until he got back on his feet. His story didn't really add up in my mind, but I mean, I I didn't press him on it. Finally, I, I told him that I was gonna get on my way, and with a strange expression on his face, he suggested that I not go behind his campsite because he had recently used the bathroom back there. Whether there was fresh fertilizer back there or not, I had no desire to hang around there any longer. 
I went a little further towards the trail I wanted to metal detect, but I had an uneasy feeling that I just couldn't shake. I decided to turn back towards the river and head back to my truck as quickly as I could. I was glad that I did not meet the guy again on my way back, nor did I ever see him in those woods again. I did see his face somewhere else, though. About two years later, his picture was in the local news. He had been apprehended by authorities for murdering his wife. He had buried her in the exact area of the forest where I had met him. In fact, he had just completed the task shortly before our encounter. Be careful when exploring the woods. You may be more than what you bargained for. Our next story is told by Brian Jeffords about a bad dream that wasn't a dream at all. When I was a young child, about four or five years old, I had a nightmare that was so vividly terrifying that I can still remember it to this day. My twin brother David and I had a bunk bed in the room at the furthest end of our house. I dreamt that I was in my bed looking out the window and saw a red sky. It was early dawn, just before sunrise. The next thing I remember is a man with crazy blue eyes and a bald head appearing in my window and staring right at me. The nightmare ended there, but I remember how much I just screamed and screamed when I woke up. I remember my mom came into my room and took me to her bedroom down the hall as she tried to calm me down. My dad wasn't in the bedroom and I wondered where he was. Fast forward to this past May, when my father was in the ICU and David, our older sister Eva, and I were staying in a nearby hotel. One night after a long day spent with my dad and our extended family, my siblings and I returned to the hotel and sat together and relaxed with a couple of beers. As we were unwinding and conversing, somehow the discussion of nightmares and dreams came up and uh, I brought up my childhood nightmare. Without missing a beat, Eva explained that this wasn't a nightmare. It really happened, and she remembers the whole thing. Eva is five years older than David and me, so this would make her nine or 10 years old at the time. Her bedroom was right next to ours and faced the front lawn and street, while ours faced the neighbor's house and their driveway with a very low fence between the two houses. Eva said that a couple of times when she was riding her bike home with her friends, she'd been followed by a bald man in a truck. One day, he followed her all the way home and drove past our house. At the time, she was a latchkey kid. David and I had a speech impediment and went to a special school 45 minutes away, so my mom had to drive all the way out there to pick us up while Eva rode her bike from school. She was never home alone for more than an hour, though. That afternoon and evening were pretty normal. Our dad came home from work. He was a police officer. We all had dinner, did homework, played, and got ready for bed. That night, after we were all sound asleep, the bald man parked his truck on our street, walked up to our house, and tried to get in through Eva's bedroom window. She woke up and saw him opening the unlocked window and screamed. My dad came storming in, hit the guy with a nightstick and shoved him back out the window. The guy ran off, but within moments, he was at my bedroom window trying to get in. Thankfully, the window was locked. Eva said I screamed as loud as I could, and my mom came in to get David and me while my dad ran out the front door to chase him. His efforts were to no avail as the bald man hauled ass right through our backyard. There was a dense wooded area right behind our backyard, which was very dark. And my dad did not want to risk being attacked in the pitch black by the intruder. So we came back inside our house and called the police. This is all Eva could remember of the story. My father sadly passed away in the hospital. As shocked as I was to hear that my childhood nightmare was a true event, I'm glad I got to hear this account of my father's bravery. He didn't hesitate to protect his family from this brazen intruder. 
must have sufficiently scared the bald-headed creep because he never returned to our home again. You're listening to Disturbed. We'll be right back. As detectives, some cases grip your soul and never let go. I'm Peter Hogan. I'm Scott Reagan. We're reopening the crime files that have haunted us. This is Watching Two Detectives. In this season, we bring you the story of Michael Furlong's murder. Margaret came to give me a CD that day. It had a song on it called, If Tomorrow Never Comes. And that was the last thing Michael ever gave me. There's some twists and turns in this, that if you wrote a script for a Hollywood movie, people would say, that's too far-fetched. So this makes a psychopath any dangerous. It was scary. Is this person or someone else now going to come after us? There was so much emotion. I slept with a knife by my bed. The drug had been administrated to him through his toothpaste. Anyone who knows this fellow knows that he doesn't play by the rules. So what does he do? He just takes off. Subscribe to Watching Two Detectives, available now on your favourite podcast platforms. Hello everyone, my name is Matt Neglia, and I am the host of the Next Best Picture podcast, part of the Film Entertainment Awards website, nextbestpicture.com. On our show, we explore all year long what is possibly going to win Best Picture at the Oscars. We do this by conducting interviews with people within the film industry, holding weekly reviews of the latest theatrical releases, and on our main show, where we dive into various different topics, answer your fan questions, and also do our best to explore Oscar history's past in hopes that it will tell us something new for this upcoming award season race. We hope that you will join us on all the various podcasting networks. We look forward to seeing you over at nextbestpicture.com. This next story comes from Reddit user Soli and is narrated by Katarina Sveta. That time I accidentally stole from a Michael's store to avoid a serial violent predator. When I was around 12 years old, my mom moved my siblings and me in with my grandparents because she didn't have enough money for rent at the time and she needed to save. It wasn't a big deal, though. They had plenty of room, and I got to spend a lot of time making jewelry with my grandma, which, in my little eyes, was such a win that I didn't even realize how poor we were. It was our little pastime after school, and one of my favorite parts was the trips we would take to Michael's to get beads and other materials. Michael's, for those who are unfamiliar, is a craft store and walking around it is a little girl's dream. One day in late fall, we realized we'd run out of wire for a bracelet I was making for my mom. So we headed out to our local Michaels to get more. As the days were getting shorter, it was already beginning to get dark by 5 p.m. My grandma had a bad hip, which made it difficult for her to walk around the large store. So she entrusted little me to run in, grab the wire, and pay for it, as I'd done so many times before. I was stubbornly independent, so she wasn't worried about me. She parked in the handicap spot right in front of the store as the sun was setting. As I was standing at the front, entranced by the Christmas decor display, a tall, dark-haired man in his mid-thirties walked in through the sliding doors. I noticed him immediately. It was hard not to. He was dressed in all black, head to toe, and his clothes were a bit dirty. His hands were shoved in his pockets, and he walked briskly, almost frantically. I couldn't help watching him. He made eye contact with me for a bit too long, then continued walking through the store. I was immediately weirded out, but I didn't think about it too much and went on my way to find the wire. I found the spool of wire, but 
getting distracted in the toy section was where I fucked up. That's when I noticed him start to follow me around, aisle to aisle. I'd be browsing and he would just appear at the other end, fake looking at stuff. He was muttering to himself constantly. As a kid, I didn't immediately realize what was happening. So I just awkwardly walked away from him each time, pretending not to notice him. My 12-year-old brain didn't think he was following me. I walked all the way across the store to the wedding aisle to look at some stuff I'd seen when I first walked in. I thought there was no way I would see him there, but sure enough, as I was looking at invitation cards, I got a spine-chilling feeling. I turned around and there he was, right behind me with his back to me, messing with something in his pants, doing something really vile to himself. He turned and looked at me, and those sunken eyes still haunt me to this day. I had never seen anything like that before, and it took me a moment to process it. But once I did, I booked it out of the store as fast as I could. I jumped into my grandma's car, startling her with my sudden appearance. I was about to explain what had just happened when I saw him appear in the sliding doors in front of us. The dread I felt at that moment was indescribable. He approached our car and knocked on my grandma's window. Not knowing the situation, she cracked the window and asked him if everything was okay. The man gestured to me with that same crazy stare and said, she's a thief, she stole from there. I was mortified that he was trying to make her suspect me on top of everything else he had just put me through. Thankfully, my grandma got the same vibes I did because she politely told him to back away and rolled the windows up while locking the door. He suddenly yanked at her door handle then swung both his arms up and started banging down hard on the car's roof, causing us both to jump and me to start crying. My grandma hastily put her car in reverse and peeled out of there. I've never seen her drive so fast. I don't remember much after that, just crying and holding a $17 spool of wire in my hands that I hadn't paid for. We called the police as soon as we got home, and luckily they took it very seriously and requested the videotapes from the Michaels. A few weeks later, my grandma told me they had found him. They mostly left me out of the investigation besides taking my statement to avoid traumatizing me further. Grandma got the dent in her car fixed, and that was that. It wasn't until a few years later that my mom finally told me what had happened to him. It turns out, he already had one battery charge and two sexual assaults on his record. One being from a minor relative of his, his niece or something. He'd just gotten off work from the gas station across the street when he must have seen me walk into Michael's alone. I don't know what would have happened if my grandma hadn't locked the car doors just in the nick of time. Our final story is narrated by our own Elizabeth Flood from r slash let's not meet. Terrifying encounter at a wedding. I recently attended my friend Courtney's wedding and I still can't get over what happened there. I grew up in a very religious household and went to church every Sunday. And Courtney is the only person from my old church whom I am still in contact with. She was super excited to see me and was definitely the only person who felt that way, judging from the stares of all the other people from my old church. The situation started at the reception. I sat down at my table and was looking at my phone when some guy I didn't know sat next to me. He said the seating chart assigned him to this table and introduced himself as the groom's friend, Anthony. He was pretty cute, so I spent a lot of time talking to him, and we really hit it off. He seemed genuinely interested in me, and didn't seem to judge me for being an atheist. 
When the dancing started, they played Brown Eyed Girl, and he offered to dance with me. We danced together for most of the night, until he left to go to the bathroom, and a little later, I did too. When I came back, I saw that my purse wasn't on the table, which was weird because I swore I'd left it there. I was tired and thought I had just left it in my car, so I went to the parking lot and found it on the center console in my car. I still thought it was weird because I really thought I had brought it inside. I went back into the venue, bringing my purse with me. I danced some more and noticed that Anthony was gone. I asked the groom about him and he said Anthony had gone home because he wasn't feeling too good. Pretty soon, I felt sick too. So I said bye to Courtney and went to my car. As I put my keys in the ignition, I looked behind me and saw something weird. It looked like something had ducked down from the trunk. I took my keys out and looked back there, and that was when I saw him. Anthony was crouched down in the trunk of my car. I started screaming and ran away as fast as I could. He got out of the trunk and chased me through the parking lot. I rushed inside the venue and told Courtney, who immediately told her husband. He walked back with me to my car, and Anthony was nowhere to be seen. After we thoroughly checked my car, I left, shaking with fear. I still feel sick to my stomach thinking about it. If I hadn't seen that flash of movement from the corner of my eye, I would have never thought to check my trunk. Anthony could have easily gone home with me and done who knows what to me, maybe even killed me. Courtney felt terrible for inviting him. Of course, she had no idea he would do such a thing. He wasn't exactly friends with the groom, but they knew each other well enough for him to be invited. I learned that at the wedding reception, he was introducing himself to people as my boyfriend and telling them he was planning on proposing. After the wedding, the groom texted Anthony to confront him, but received no response. I could tell he had rifled through my purse and looked at my ID, which meant he now knew my full name and home address. A couple days later, he showed up at my job and lurked around the parking lot. He ran off when he saw security. I found a note on my windshield from him that just said, I'm watching. I've notified security about him, so hopefully I will be safe at my workplace. But what about my house? I'm worried that if I step out of my home at any time, he could be there waiting for me. So for now, I'm staying at my aunt's house. I'm currently filing for a restraining order against him, hoping that that will provide me some peace of mind, because I'm absolutely horrified. Who could have known that attending a friend's wedding could lead to this kind of terror? Want more Disturbed? Check out our Patreon for member-exclusive content, early merch access, and other cool perks. I'm your host, Doug Bailey, and this has been Disturbed, a production of Killer Podcasts and part of the Evergreen Network. For more paranormal and true crime shows, visit killerpodcasts.com. Follow our social channels at Disturbed Podcast on Instagram or Disturbed underscore pod on Twitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider subscribing and reviewing on your favorite listening platform. Share your own true horror story at DisturbedPodcast.com. Music by Epidemic Sound and by Carl Casey at White Bat Audio. Our producers are Noah Fouts and Elizabeth Flood. Our audio engineer is Nathan Corson. Executive producers Bridget Coyne and Gerardo Orlando. Until next time, stay safe out there. From DNA testing to the Dixie Mafia, Crime Capsule brings you new stories of true crime in American history. I'm your host, Benjamin Morris. 
Join us for exclusive interviews with authors from Arcadia Publishing, writing the hottest books on the most chilling stories of our country's past. You can find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts or on evergreenpodcasts.com. Crime Capsule. History so interesting, it's criminal.